Could you put your hands together to welcome Sister C.C. Honaka to minister in this pulpit in the mighty name of Jesus. Karibu sana. Amen. In my country, our, our history is that the pioneers moved from the east to the west. And they had great courage in doing so. But what they didn't know was it was occupied by a hostile environment. And oftentimes, even in the Christian world, when you go to pioneer or do something different, you are the first to get shot at. So I don't know about you, but when you're breaking ground to do things differently, oftentimes there is an attack that comes. And you need to guard and bathe your pastors in prayer because they are got God's mindset, not only for this hour, but for the hour to come. This facility is beautiful and it takes a visionary to be able to see a plot of dirt and a couple poles and all of a sudden you can see it filled with people learning about Jesus. You can see um, foundations being laid. You can see ministries being developed. See, if you're new to this place, you're taking part of something that it took a while to build. See, I've been there because when, I, when my husband and I first started ministry, we didn't have someone to lead worship and it wasn't me and it wasn't my husband we would stand up and say praise the Lord but we could not sing a lick and we begin to pray and ask God God send us people that will join arms that we may be able to further your kingdom and it is not an easy thing it takes someone who can see into what is nothing and see God moving and so what I'm going to challenge you with today is to guard that to guard over that because not everybody has that and not everybody has someone that can look at what could be and have the faith to step out on nothing and be able to do it and I, you are a product of somebody's vision and you need to be thankful and embrace it my name is Cece Honaker my husband's name is Johnny uh, I greet you on his behalf I left part of me in America because he is my very best friend he is my biggest supporter he is my biggest uh, fan he he encourages me so much and I, I miss him I miss him tremendously and the rest of the ladies I am with are going on safari to see lions and tigers and uh, monkeys. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going home to see my husband. And hurry. I, but I want to see it with him. So I will come back one day because I, I miss him so much. And I miss my family so much. Uh, we, we talk through the telephone and um, we, we just encourage one another and pray for one another. And he has prayed for you this morning because he knew that I was going to be here. I, it, we are one. You, so if you've seen me, you've seen him. He is the better preacher. He is the better looking one. <laughs> mm. He is the sweet one. He is like just candy. He is. Um, are you familiar with Santa Claus? It is him. He is. He is Santa Claus. He he just embraces and loves everybody. And I, I feel so privileged to be uh, an extension of him. He we met very young. We met as a product of in our country. We have a bus ministry. Um, they would take a bus and they would um, go get children and bring them to children's church. Their parents didn't come. Uh, my parents weren't saved. And the bus would come. And it would pick me up, and it would pick my husband up, and that's where we met, right on that bus coming to Sunday school. We didn't have parents that were in the ministry. We didn't have parents who knew Jesus. But God reached down and plucked us out of the, the family that we were a part of and said, I am going to use you mightily. And so I have a, a special love story that starts all the way from childhood. Now, he was older than me. That's one thing I have on him. <laughs> and um, it, it, I did not recognize him that way uh, because there was such a difference in our age. Um, but later, like when we were in high school, we fell in love, in love so much. I mean, just so much. And um, 
I would like to say that we lived happily ever after, but we didn't. We didn't. We had a lot of struggles and a lot of trials. And my heartbeat and my husband's heartbeat is to minister to people in their marriages because you can love Jesus with all your heart and still you, you can be a wonderful woman of God and not be a great wife. You can be a wonderful man and a great friend and everything, but not necessarily be a good husband because maybe you didn't see those things in your life to be able to model after it. And so our heartbeat is to be able to instruct people in that way. But God is faithful. And what you give to him, he is going to make it come to fruition. And the Lord did a work in our heart. And what we thought was long gone, long dead, all the romance and all the love because of silly things we had done, God breathed new fire in it. And we are more in love today than we were the day we got married. <laughs> So thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you, pastors. It is an honor and a privilege. To, I can feel wisdom uh, from this woman and this man. They, they are seasoned. This is not their first time out. I, I can just feel the presence of the Lord. Um, I want to read two scriptures to you. Uh, the first one is in Revelations. And my notes are so bad because we, we are in a dorm room. And I, not to disturb my other uh, people in my room, I wrote them in the dark. So <laughs> I had a little flashlight and, and I'm writing. So I want you to look up two scriptures and then you can put your hand where one of them is. The other one is 1 Kings chapter 19. I may not read all of 1 Kings chapter 19, but I will reference it. Revel Revelations 2.20. But this I have against you, that you have tolerated that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and um, to take um, food sacrificed to idols. That is in Revelations. Now turn to 1 Kings. Now, Revelations 2.20 here is talking about a spirit. It is talking, um, it's not referencing this actual person that, that lived and breathed in this uh, chapter that we're reading about in 1 Kings, but it is the same spirit. So even though Jezebel is, we know her story and how she died, her spirit lives on. Her spirit to be able to divide, her spirit to be able to intimidate the, the man and the woman and the work of God is still alive. And you, you may be looking at me and you may be thinking, well, I thought you said we were a good church, that we, were, we reminded you of home. Yes, we have the spirit of Jezebel at our, in our church too because when you read 1 Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 19, it is a revelation of the story of Jezebel. And we read this story and it's one of the, our favorite. We're Pentecostal, so we like fire fire we love fire how about you do you like fire in church yes and we like the fire of God and it says that uh, Elijah went up against all these prophets all by himself and he prayed and God answered with fire so just because you have fire in the house doesn't mean that you're not going to battle Jezebel because Jezebel is a snake. And when you set things on fire, the snakes come out. And you have to be ready to deal with those things and those serpents that will try to infiltrate the house of God, that will try to make you feel bad as a person and not live up to what God has called you to do. You have to be able to see the serpent trying to touch your marriage or touch your family, and you have to be able to deal with it. And we see this mighty man of God, Elijah. I mean, he prayed and God listened and fire fell. Can you imagine ever being scared of anything if that happened to you? If you prayed and fire fell, wouldn't you just think that you would never, ever be scared of anything again? But the Bible says that when Jezebel heard everything that had happened, she makes a decree. She makes a promise. She makes a threat. And she says, 
okay, Elijah, I'm going to take you out. And if you have a call of God on your life, you can be sure that the devil has made that threat and promise against your life. Oh, you may be going to church now, but I promise you, I'm going to take you out. You may have a good church now, but I promise you, I'm going to get in there and cause division. You may have a good marriage now, but I'm going to cause destruction. You have to know that we are in a battle. And as these last days go on, it's going to intensify. But I don't know about you, but I, I'm not scared of things I expect. Um, I grew up, my sister was older than me. She's a lot taller than me. She doesn't look like me at all. She's got blonde hair, she's got long legs, real thin and strong. And, but she, she was tough. And when I was growing up, if I didn't listen to her, she would beat me up. I mean, beat me up. And I, I, I'm like, I remember one time, I, she told me to clean my room. And she was just being mean, okay? She told me to clean my room, and I told her I wasn't. And so I was going to run to my grandma's. And my little legs don't run as fast as hers. <laughs> and I ran as fast as I could, and I looked behind me, and there she is, like a cheetah, <laughs> running after me. And I'm like, just as fast as I can, you know? And, and she catches me by my hair, and she drags me, kicking and screaming, all the way home. And, and you know, the story goes on that I, remember I ran in the house and told my mom, and, um, you know, she got in trouble. So, <laughs> but she deserved it. But what I want to tell you is I grew up with a tough sister who would beat me up if I didn't do what she told me to do. But you know what? When I came through it, as a young woman, I was never scared of anybody. I didn't care how big they were. Because if my sister didn't kill me, this person was not going to be able to kill me. Because I survived her, I was going to be able to survive anybody. So I grew up kind of not scared of anybody, even though I'm short and, and, you know, I wasn't scared. But you know where I get scared? If I don't know what to expect. If I see you one-on-one... -on -one, I'm okay. I'm not scared. But if you are sneaky and, and, and try to, to, to manipulate, I start getting scared. When we do church, the enemy comes to church too. And he will send people on assignment just to defeat you. And, you, and the man and the woman of God who have birthed this vision... The enemy will see, I've got to do something to cause destruction. And they're not going to come boldly and say, thus saith the Lord, this church is Ichabog. They're not going to do that. Because you, we would be able to cast that down in the name of Jesus. What they do is very subtly get in the ear of the people and begin to whisper things. I don't think pastor is hearing from God like he used to. I don't think Mama Florence is being nice to me. I, I think she doesn't like me. I think Pastor is too busy with other things. He can't pay attention to my needs. That's the spirit of Jezebel. It whispers and it slithers in and out of the hearts of people. And God is calling us to deal with it. He's calling us to call it down in the name of Jesus, to not let it reside in the hearts. Oftentimes, I tell people this, I am not scared. I am not scared of bad people. I'm not scared of even evil people. I'm scared. What's the word? I don't want to say stupid, but that's the only word I can think of. Naive. I am scared of naive people because I recognize the enemy at work. I recognize when somebody comes in with an agenda and they're all smiles and, and being real sweet to my face, but yet when they are manipulating behind the scene, I can recognize that. But naive people, babes in Christ, people who have not developed, it looks 
like gold. It's shiny and, and they look all spiritual and they look all deep in the word, but they can't see past the illusion. And we as the believers have to ask God to open our spiritual eyes and ask for discernment. Because everything that glitters is not gold. Everything that glitters is not for real. And we have to rise up. We have to grow up in God that you can discern when that is going on. Because not only will it wreak havoc in your church, it will wreak havoc in your life, on your job. It will wreak havoc in your family. And you have to be able to call it down in the name of Jesus. See, this... This woman, Jezebel, she struck fear in the prophet, the prophet of God. And he starts to run. If you read that passage, it says in verse 3, Elijah was afraid. It's not flesh and blood that we're fighting. It is the spirit of the enemy. And we have to recognize and do battle in the spirit. It says that he ran and he came to a city and he tells his servant, I want you to stay here. This is how you know if you're battling a spirit of Jezebel. It can be girl, it can be boy, it can be male, it can be female. It is a spirit. Okay? It is a spirit that manipulates and gets into the hearts of the people. This is how you know if you're battling it. One of the first thing you have fear. You don't really realize why. Why am I so afraid? You know, I know God's done great things for me, but I just feel unsettled. I, I, I don't have the confidence. There's, there's something churning in my heart. The next thing that the prophet does that lets him, us know that he's dealing with that spirit is that he leaves his servant, one of the first things that you will do if you're battling that is you want to disconnect. You want to separate because you just, you want to disconnect from the body of Christ because there's this whisper in your ear that's telling you things that, that you're not cared for, that you're not loved, that, that this person may be even uh, manipulating and trying to make you feel that way. So if you are, all of a sudden feel like you want to pull away, you've been in church your whole life, but all of a sudden you want to disconnect, that's the spirit of Jezebel. It says, as we read it on, read on, it says, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. Jezebel will drive you to the desert. He, that spirit will drive you away from the nourishment of the Bible and the nourishment of prayer. It will drive you away from the things that will feed you. If you allow that spirit to have a hold on you. It will want to push you away. And it may be operating in someone else, but it may make you feel like you're not good enough. Because if you continue on in this scripture, it says, Elijah says, I've had enough, Lord. I can't do this anymore. And if there's ever been a person who has said that, it has been me. Because there has been a time in my life where there's been a couple of times, there's spirits of Jezebel, and then there's this all-out attack of the enemy of Jezebel. And we had a lady in our church who seemed so spiritual. She seemed like she really loved Jesus. It seemed like she had everything to say at the right time, but something just didn't fit with me. My spirit would churn, and I would hear things that she would very subtly say that let me know as the pastor's wife, she was undermining me. She was saying stuff to people that, that were, she was putting, she would take a situation that wasn't at all uh, negative, and she would retell it in such a way that it would make the person seem like I had said something bad about them. She was good at manipulating and changing words. And you have to be careful with that spirit because it makes you feel like you are not good enough. When I was dealing with this lady in my church, I would all of a sudden come in contact with other ladies. And I could tell if they had been in conversation with her. 
because they acted different. There was all, we had a connection. We were, you know, doing good. It may not be that I can spend all this time with them, but it was a good connection. But then when I would talk to them after she had been with them, there was this something dark. You could tell that they were on guard. They were watching me more closely. And I began to sense this is a spirit of Jezebel. And I am a very reserved person. I am quiet. I, I, don't, I don't talk a lot. I, 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 when I get up here, the Lord helps me to speak. But if I were just like hanging out with you, I probably, it's harder for me to do conversation. My husband is the talker. He, he can be on a lift. And by the time he gets to the top, he knows your, your whole history. He knows who your grandma is and where you came from and what tribe you're a part of. And, and, and he just has this connection with people. Me, I'm, I, I try not to be rude, but I, 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 that's not who I am. And I begin to question, God, am I, is something wrong with me? And this spirit began to tell me, you're not good enough. You're not a good pastor's wife. There's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your personality. Why can't you just go up and hold all these conversations like everybody else? Why do you have to be so quiet? Why do you have to do do, 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 over and over and over? And it is a spirit of Jezebel that wants you to be out of position because Elijah was not supposed to run. He was not supposed to be in the desert. He, it will cause you to move out of position. Now, I dealt with this woman, and she, she, I tried so hard. I wanted her to like me so much. I would buy her things. I would, I, would, I, would just, I would just try so hard. And she would act like it for a moment. And then I would see her again slithering around talking to people. And I began to say, God, protect us from the spirit of Jezebel. Protect us from someone who has an agenda that is not like you. Oh, some of our people just loved her. Some of our people thought she was just spiritual. And I'm just telling you, there, this woman had an agenda to try to take me out. She became very fixated on trying to destroy my reputation. Why would she do that? The, the enemy knows if he takes out leadership, those following him stumble. So if you're leading a ministry and all of a sudden you feel like your, your leadership is being under attack, that's the spirit of Jezebel. Now, not every single time we have a disagreement is it a spirit of the Jezebel. Not every single time that we, you know, get angry at one another is it a spirit of Jezebel. I have dealt with, right now, three times in my life that I know without a shadow of a doubt it was a spirit of Jezebel. And this woman was trying to undermine my authority. She wanted to shift the authority that I had for my ministry to her. This is another thing. You know you're dealing with a spirit of Jezebel when it calls you what it is. We, if you read this story earlier in, in Kings, it says that Ahab meets Elijah, and he says, oh, you troubler of Israel. And Elijah says, yeah, right, that's you. Oftentimes, the enemy will want to tell you that you are something that is really him. And this woman would say, I think she's jealous of me. I think da 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 da. She doesn't want me to, you know, to have any kind of influence. And I'm telling you, before the Lord, I searched my heart. There was no jealousy in me for her. I didn't want what she had. I didn't want to be her. And I said, God, I recognize this as a spirit of Jezebel because the devil is calling me what he is. She is operating in that spirit. And she is jealous because she cannot steal that influence. And you have to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with the spirit of Jezebel in your life, it will lead you to the desert. It will cause you to disconnect from things that will feed you. It will cause you to end up in a cave. It says that Elijah got so down and so broken dealing with this spirit that he said, God 
just kill me. Just take me out. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of dealing with it. And it is such a heavy oppression that you feel like you're going to just self-destruct. And I can be honest with you, if I did not know Jesus, and I did not know that God had called me into the ministry, if I wasn't as sure of that calling, I don't know if I'd still be in ministry today because of the lies of the enemy and how powerful and how that, that, that spirit just gets in your mind and wants to defeat you. I can remember the day I was called in the ministry. I was sitting third row from the front and two seats in. And our pastor, he's standing there. And he, I'm about eight years old at the very most. And he's preaching on a Sunday night. And he says, some of you will be pastors. And some of you will be pastor's wives. And I said, No. No, 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 no. Uh, I said, oh, God, how boring. <laughs> I did. I said, I would never want to be a pastor's wife. That would be so boring. And I'll tell you, it's nothing, nothing close to boring. But God called me in the ministry right then and there when I was eight years old. And he put that stamp on my heart that I knew I was called to be able to further his kingdom. And I had seen miracle after miracle happen in my life. I remember having dreams when I was a little girl and I saw myself preaching and people were getting saved. I remember seeing God do miracles in my spirit and I knew powerfully God had did so many miracles I knew that God had called me for such a time as this but that spirit was so strong and it was so debilitating that I began to crumble under it and I began to ask myself God did I miss it did I miss your calling am I not supposed to be here I was very, um, my husband is a wonderful, wonderful preacher, but he was very, um, uh, he would let me preach, and I was very active, and, and he would let me speak on those off days, and he encouraged me a lot, and I began to shriek back from it. I began to say, no, I don't want to do it. You go ahead. I, I, I don't want to, and I began to step out of my God-given position. I begin to say, no, let someone else. And in the beginning, we think that we're being humble. We think that we're just doing the right thing. And I remember this lady and her husband, and it was her, her husband wanted to speak, but I was scheduled. And I said, God, I don't, I don't want to step out of line. I, I want to be humble. I, I, I'm going to let this person speak. Her husband and very loudly God said this to me he said if you let him speak he says you're not listening to me you rise and walk in the authority that I have given you if you take a step back I'm not asking you to do that. See, a lot of times in the church that we don't understand the difference between humbleness and being able to walk in the authority that God has given us. We have to be able to say, I know that God has called me. And under the leadership of this house, I were going to serve to the best of my ability. And you can be sure that you are going to have a tax against what God has called you to do. If it's working with children, if it's, if it's preaching, if it's playing the organ if it's singing you are going to have an attack and if you don't make up your nine right now no matter what comes what may I'm going to serve you you are going to encounter this spirit and you're going to end up in a cave and God's going to have to say to you that you what are you doing here Elijah why are you in this cave I didn't send you to hide away I sent you and gifted you to do the work of the ministry, but you've allowed the spirit of Jezebel to defeat you. And you are going to have to stand firm in the knowledge of knowing 
that God has called you and begin to do spiritual warfare. I began to pray in the Holy Ghost. You couldn't hardly find me if I was by myself that I wasn't praying in the Holy Ghost. Because when that fear and that doubt tried to rest on me like a dark cloud, I would pray in the Holy Ghost and it would lift. That spirit will follow you. You may think, oh, well, I just won't go to church anymore because it's that one person that, that really, they, they make me feel so bad. I promise you, if you don't defeat it, it will follow you. You will encounter it again. I, these people left our church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a saying in the States, some bless you by coming, some bless you by going. And I, I was so happy when they left. I was so happy that God had delivered us. Now, they didn't go away quietly. They went away kicking and screaming and saying bad stuff about uh, my husband and I. But the Lord took them out of influence in our church body. And I'll tell you this, I thought I'm free of her, hallelujah. I don't have to deal with that spirit of Jezebel anymore. God has called me out of my cave and I was back doing the things that I used to do when I was walking in anointing and I went on a missions trip to Cuba. And I had got where I wore, I don't have it on today. Um, do you recognize the term dog tag like soldiers wear? Well, in our, um, I had one that had the scripture. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me shall be condemned. I wore that scripture on my neck. And every time that woman, when she was still in our church, would, would, I would feel that. I would, I would almost like a rosary pray. Lord, I, I'm standing upon your word. You're going to take care of this. You're going to, to, to defeat this. What I should have done is the authority that God gave me dealt with it face to face, but I didn't. But I allowed God to move her, and I thought I was done. And then I ended up in Cuba, and I was so happy to be in Cuba. I know that God had called me for that moment, much like this one. And I'm, they introduced the missionaries, and we we're going to give a little bit of what, they're, what you're going to say. So I go up, and just like you guys, I told you, I told them my story. I told her that I, I knew I was called in the ministry. I, I knew that God had called me and how I got saved on that bus. And I just knew that God had a plan for my life. And I know that God had called me there to minister to them. And I did it with such confidence. This lady who I did not know who was not with our group, ironically, she looked like the other lady back in the, you know, the U.S. <laughs> she gets up and through the interpreter begins to mock me. She says, she says, well, I wasn't called in the ministry as a young age. And the interpreter, she's like, you know, and she interprets, you know. But you could tell she was uncomfortable. And every single, like, giant step that I had talked about God's goodness, she began to mock it. And, and deflate it and be able to undermine it. In that moment, it was like I was in a spiritual bubble. It, it, didn't, it didn't penetrate. I knew that she was doing it, and I knew that it was ugly, but it didn't penetrate because I was fixing to preach, and I, I believe that God puts us in an anointing that, you know, we are in spiritual bubbles. And that's why your pastor can be up here full of fire and life, and then he walk off the stage, and the spirit lift, and all the weight of the world can land on him. It's not that he's not who he says he is. He is a man that walks in the anointing, that once you step out and step out of the anointing, the world begins to actually penetrate us and actually begins to wound us. That's why you have to pray for them. And so when I got through speaking that day, Mind you, she put earplugs in her ears. I was too loud. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I the flesh, you know. Oh, woman, I want to take care of you through the, the flesh and lay hands on you. But God said no. And I'm just telling you with the boldness of my heart, I began to pray, God, God, 
the same questions I'd already asked him, do you really have me here? Am I really doing what you want me to do? And I began to pray and pray. And all of a sudden, there was this light that went off in my head. And it said, you are battling the same spirit. You are battling, even though it was in the U.S., now you're battling it in Cuba. It doesn't matter what church you go to. If you don't get victory over that spirit, it will never let you become the woman or the man of God that he has called you to be. And you can think what you want. You will encounter this. It is one of the nastiest, strongest spirits that are, is out there. And you and me have to be able to recognize it and deal with it in the spirit. And I begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, God, it's not going to defeat me. You will help me be strong in you. And I began to pray in the Holy Ghost and God gave me a word for those people the next day. And I was able to bring it forth in power and demonstration. But before it had totally defeated me and I had just ran into that cave and I was able to recognize it this time. God is calling you out of your cave. There is much work to be done in this house. This is a place of new beginnings. This is a place of restoration. This is where the hurt and the wounded come. But they don't stay that way. You, you can be broken as a Christian. And you can have painful situations in your life. That is okay. But the problem is you can't stay that way. You have to allow the God to heal you. Maybe you went through a divorce. You know what? That's sad and I'm sorry that you're hurt. But you can't keep living there. You may have went through a bad situation on your job. And you may have felt really betrayed. But you can't stay there. You have to be able to walk in the new authority that God has given you and not let that spirit keep you defeated and hiding. I just felt this so strongly. I didn't want to preach this. I wanted to preach something, I don't know, exciting. Something glorious. You're more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. You know, you're the head and not the tail. You know, just walk in abundance. And I believe all those things. God has been so good to me. I believe them with all my heart. But I do believe there's a spirit that attacks the house of God. And it limits God's people from doing what they're supposed to do. And we sometimes think that it's humility but really, it's our brokenness and that spirit of the enemy that wants to keep us hiding in a cave. God has sent me here to tell you guys, it's time for you to come out of the cave. You can't hide forever. God's got something for you to do. And your something doesn't look like somebody else's something. God called me in the ministry because he has a sense of humor. I don't know how to sing. Mama Florence was trying to clap with me during one of your songs. It was just pitiful. You know, it just it wasn't working because I don't, I don't have any rhythm. I had just none whatsoever. I just kept missing. And she's like, oh, bless God. <laughs> that poor soul. <laughs> I could read her mind. And, and I, I'm, I, I will tell that story when I go home because they know how bad I am. I mean, one time I was sitting on the front row and I'm praising God just as loud as I can. And my worship leader looks at me and says, please don't clap. You're throwing me off beat. And, and I, I'm, I'm beyond bad, okay? It, it's just that I can't do it. I'm, beyond, I'm bad. I, it's just awful. I, I, I can't. I, I, I can't do it. And then, you know, in our, in our culture, you know, you almost tried out to be a pastor's wife. You had to send in a resume almost, you know. Oh, can you cook? No, <laughs> I can't cook. I was married by a single mom who worked all the time. We, we had, in our, our culture, it's called macaroni and cheese. It came out of a box. You dumped it in there, you heated it up, and, and stirred some powder cheese on it. You like, I love it, but, you know, it's not necessarily gourmet. And I know secretly my husband probably wishes <laughs> that I was a better cook, but he doesn't tell me that, so that's okay. So I couldn't do, I couldn't play the piano. You know, if you're going to pioneer a church, you should be able to play the piano and your husband preach. No, it didn't work that way for me. And I let the enemy use the spirit of Jezebel 
to keep me in a cave. Listen, God is calling you out of that cave because there are people you have to minister to. There is a work to be done. This is new beginnings. This is not a cemetery for you to come in. I was hurt there. I feel good here. No, this is new beginnings. I am going to be refreshed and I'm going to work again. I'm going to allow God to speak to me again. Maybe there was failure in my life, but that doesn't have to define who we are. Maybe you have some sort of addiction in your past, but God has set you free. Maybe you're still struggling with it, and you think, oh, I'm never going to be used. God can't set you free. But God is calling you out of that cave, and God is saying, why are you here? I didn't put you there. God is calling you to come forth in the boldness and in the power that he has given you to support your leadership. Support them in more than clap, clap, clap. You know, praise God. I, 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 I like to be, you know, clap, clap for me. But I personally think that put your money where your mouth is. Support their vision with financial giving. For, support their vision intangible works support their vision by praying for their family I have two children they're preachers kids you may think like I did before I had them that their life is perfect they're raised by the man and woman of God and when they wake up in the morning they actually hear angels singing hallelujah because you're in the pastor's house you know that's how it is you're waking up in the pastor's house and angels fly around and you know I actually had a lady in our church ask somebody I wonder how it is in the pastor's house you know on Sunday afternoon do they sit around and read the Bible and sing and pray not that we don't see you know not that we don't do those things but your people you're human. You, you, you have needs, flesh and blood. You get tired. You get your feelings hurt. You allow your man and woman of God to be real and understand. If you want to be like the children of Israel, why is it that he, Moses has only gone a few minutes and they're erecting this golden calf? Because people want leaders and they want to worship things that are fake. They want to worship things that are shiny and glittery, but they don't understand. If they want the real man of God, Moses had his problems. Moses had things he had to deal with, and he was flesh and blood. And we have to understand that the man and woman of God are real people, and we have to bind them up and not let that spirit of Jezebel affect their family. Don't be talking about their kids. Be praying about their kids. Don't be talking about what they're driving. Driving. Pray that it gets better. Don't be talking about where they live. Pray that it gets better. Because I'm telling you, the anointing flows from the top to the bottom. And if you're in a house where the man of God is blessed, if you are obedient, and if you do the instruction that he has given you, that anointing will flow down. And so many, I just, in, the, in America, it's like this. I want to be a son or a daughter in God. And I want your anointing to rest upon me. Until you tell them something they don't want to hear. I'm sorry. If you want to be my son and my daughter, you have to be able to recognize that I am human. You have to be able to recognize that there are days that I have bad moods. You have to recognize that I can get on you and you still love me. Because if you, <laughs> because if you can't do that, if you can't allow the man and woman of God to discipline you, if you're going to get mad and go to a different church, you are not a son or daughter of God. You are not. You are a visitor. And you will never inherit the blessings that will flow from them. And you have to be able to put your own pride and your own selfish desires aside and say, God, I will be obedient to what you've called me to do. I don't care if they're right or wrong. They are my leadership, and I am going to follow them. I, I'm not calling, saying to walk in some sort of abomination. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about listening to the man and woman of God that is walking in God-given anointing. When my husband and I were pastoring, we were youth pastors first under our, our pastor that we were helped saved under. And I know I'm running out of time. 
But I just feel this so powerfully. Hmm. When we were living in Miami, my son was very little. And I was in college at the university. And I didn't have a computer. But the church had a computer. So I go to the church to do my homework. And I had brought my, my son with me. And it was during office hours. And he's, you know, ah, you know, he's not conducting himself like, you know, someone in the office should. And my pastor tells me, he said, Cece, he says, I want you to not do your homework during office hours. Take John Wesley home. <laughs> Doesn't he know that I don't make hardly nothing? And that this is the only time that I could do this paper? Doesn't he care? Da, 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 da. I went in there. I was crying. Tears aren't always righteous. Okay? And I went in there and I told my husband, I said, he said this. He hurt my feelings. And this is the kind of man I married. He said, I want you to go home. That is my pastor. And I left more mad at my husband than I was at the pastor. <laughs> because I was so mad at him. But I... Um, and to make the story, long story short, I honored that man. And he is still in my life today. We laugh about it now. He says, nah, I probably should let you do it. You know, we laugh about it. But what it was is the spiritual side of it. I submitted to authority. Something so little. Something I could justify that I was right. But I submitted to the spiritual authority, and God blessed me. God doesn't ask you just to honor your pastors when they're right. That's not submission. That's agreement. Submission is when you don't think that it should be done that way. But because he is the leader, and because he has birthed this vision, and because God has given him the vision for this place, you are going to run with it if you're going to stay here. Once you can't connect... With the vision over the house. Don't be the, think you're the spiritual police and are going to come in and change the pastor. You, God may be moving you. Or you can say, I'm going to submit. Because I'm telling you, I submitted to that man. And to this day, if I have a problem, I call him and I say, Pastor, what do I say? What do I do? Pastor, my son is battling depression. Here, honey, let me pray for you. Pastor, I don't know what to do in this situation. Let me pray for you. And I honored the man of God in my life. I honored the woman of God in my life. And I didn't let those, those nasty Jezebel spirits. When my husband was a, an associate, they would come up to him and say, I sure wish you would preach more. If you're an associate here and somebody does that to you, you say, I bind you in the name of Jesus because that is a spirit. They are flattering you. They, are, they, they can encourage you, but they don't have to cut somebody else to do it. And, and, and you have to recognize, ask God to take those blinders off of your eyes. You know, if somebody, he, they used to tell my husband, oh, I enjoy you so much. And, and my husband says, I'm not talking to them. Because what they're trying to do is undermine my pastor. Doesn't mean that they can't think that he preaches well and encourage him. But he recognized the spirit. See, at Christians, we're so good at hiding our sin. We can camouflage it real good. But God knows. And he is calling us to walk in integrity. He's calling us to walk in humility. He's calling us to deal with the pride that's in our life. He's calling us to get rid of the fear and come out of that cave and submit to the vision over the house you're serving in and just help usher in, help usher in the goodness that God has given and blessing over your city through this church. I am a product of a good church. Yes, it was God, but it was the people of God that came and got me. God didn't drive that bus. He didn't preach the sermons. It was the people of God that rallied around a vision that changed my life.